Cat and Moose podcast. I'm Cat and I'm Moose. This is a true life podcast where we explore the quirks of being human. Hey Cat. Hey Moose. Hey Sarah. Yo. Yo, happy happy Oh, happy Monday. Happy Monday. <laughs> Surprise! Wait, it's Monday. It's not Wednesday. What's going on? Well, although we love a good hump day, whoa, uh, it didn't it didn't work out. We heard from so many of our listeners that we want Mondays. We want Mondays. And also, like like hump day was not working for us either. Mm-mm. It's like we couldn't get in the river. We couldn't be in the woo nah. way. Like we were we were getting confused. Like have we even done the podcast this week? And it's like wait, this is like the highlight of our week most weeks. Like how do we not even remember or know when we're doing it? So guys, we are back. Monday is your day. Monday, Monday. So good to me. Speaking of the mamas and papas and their song Monday Monday, um, Wilson Phillips has released a new cover song. Oh. Oh. For those of you who don't know, mamas and the papas are the mamas and the papas of the Wilson Phillips. They are? <laughs> well, sort of. Are you serious? Yeah. <gasps> wow. Carney's mom. Is the mama? <laughs> Cat, just do it. Cause I don't know. <laughs> I could sing all their damn songs, but Lord knows I don't. I'm not the Wikipedia of Wilson Phillips like you are. Well, and I, I am the Wikipedia of Wilson Phillips. Wiki, wiki, <laughs> and um, um, John and Michelle Phillips of the Mamas and Papas. Half of the Mamas and Papas are the parents of China Phillips, um, <laughs> who is the blonde-headed lady in Wilson Phillips. And then not related to Carney or Wendy, not at, at all. all. No, not at all. Um, and Carney and Wendy are sisters, and they are um, the daughter of uh, Brian Wilson from the Beach Boys. Whoa, that's cool. Yeah. I had no idea, guys. No idea. Thanks. Yeah. Great musical heritage. Yep. So what's the cover song? It's called Boyfriends, and it's it's a Harry Styles song, and it's terrible. It's terrible. It's terrible. Mm. Wait, have you listened to the original? No, even it's terrible. I don't need to listen to the original. It's like, I love my girls, don't get me wrong. But like, I think this song in and of itself is terrible. And so um, I, I would like a redo. Well, nothing Harry Styles does is terrible. So I need you oh. to go back and re-listen to that. That's true. Wow. Okay. That's. A, I mean, she has a good point. I mean, I secretly think that he could be the future Elton John. Oh, wow. Oh, I thought you were going to say the Antichrist. Oh, geez. <laughs> Damn. No, but don't worry. I have Antichrist on my list of things to talk about today. So <laughs> of course, it's, of course we're on the same page once again. <laughs> and once again, here we are talking about the same shit on a different day. Get it? <laughs> I just wrote down in my notes, Christina, but I meant to write Christians. So I got to find a way to work <laughs> Christina in. I don't know if it's Aguilera or my grandmother's name was Christina. We're going to find out. My former hairstylist name is Christina. You got any stories about her? I do. She's the one who was with me when I bought $834 worth of rocks. <laughs> oh, that's fun. <laughs> you mean crystals for those who haven't listened before. Super important. <laughs> right, right. And and I was um, gently reminded yesterday that for Christmas, I am not allowed to get any more gifts of um, <laughs> crystals or blankets. Blankets. Oh, see, I love a good blanket, too. Oh, uh, and I do, too. And I get one just about every Christmas from somebody hmm. there's somebody who's like oh you're a massage therapist now you must need a blanket for your table or hmm. you know one of my family members is like oh this blanket reminded me of the decor in your guest room so I got you this and so I too love a good blanket and I, I've realized lately that I have just a few too many 
Um, and so, um, so yeah, this year I'm on, I'm on crystal and blanket restriction for the holidays. Mm. Well, shit guys, I've got some <laughs> gifts to return. <laughs> no, she's allowed to receive them. She's just not allowed to buy them. Well, that's a, yeah, it's a great way to look at it. Moose. We're here for you. If you need to feed that addiction. Yeah, we are here for you. Uh, by the way, I'm doing a whole thing for Christmas because, um, do you ever see those ads on Instagram that say like, um, I overspent in 2021 and I'm paying for it in 2022. I've never seen that in my life. Oh, they're basically like those debt consolidation ads or whatever. Mm -hmm. But anyway, all that to say that is sort of my life. And I always <laughs> go big on Christmas and I am sure I'm making up for some mm -hmm. <laughs> unmet gift that I didn't receive as like a <laughs> four and a half year old. God bless me. But anyway, I, um, I always go big to the point that I forget that I've bought gifts and then someone will have like 16 gifts and the other people have like 14. So you're like, Oh shit, I, I messed up, but it's out of control. And I have recognized my Christmas out of control. So I have chosen to put my excitement about Christmas into, into decorations, not oh. newly purchased ones, just making sure that my house feels like Christmas instead of just consuming. I'm tired of consuming. That's my thing. And so this year, the household rule, and Kat, you will also have a stocking in our household, is you can buy anything that fits into a stocking. And that is the Christmas we're doing. And and honestly, like you can't go crazy and do like $100 gift cards. You gotta just be reasonable. Since when do we have to prove our love with Christmas gifts? <laughs> I'm stepping down from my, what's it called? Soap box. Well, as, as usual, I have questions. Um, so what is the size limit of the stocking itself? It's a pretty big stocking. Oh, it's about we, we, we. It's like two, f a foot and a half. It's we. Like a standard stocking. Uh, a standard stocking. Well, we'll get a picture for people to see for reference. The size difference between the human stockings and the pet stockings. Okay. Okay, this is awesome. Yeah, there is a size difference there. Large. Very, very large. Maybe like a 2XL? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, 2XL for, for Archie, Montana, Bella, Vincent, and Frankenstein. And then there's Cousin Happy. Cousin Happy. And Happy. And then Aunt Pixie is the cat. <laughs> Aunt P who is that? Well, that's... That's my mom's cat. Oh. So it would be... That's Sarah's aunt, I think. No, it's your cousin. No. No, it's your sister. <laughs> so your mom's cat is your... Are you... What? Yeah. Your mom's cat is your sister? <laughs> it is. <laughs> so to the rest of y'all, that's Aunt Pixie. This is amazing. <laughs> Guys, what is yeah. happening right now? Okay, all, I'm done. I'm done with Christmas. We want to move on. <laughs> okay. Well, I want to talk about, um, I have been, I had to drive a lot this past week. And um, so that gave me time in the car and I got to listen to a few podcasts. Mm -hmm. And one of my um, newfound friends um, is a therapist. And I love having friends who are therapists yeah, because yeah. like they're so smart. And I also am technically a therapist of the massage type. So um, anyway, my friend was featured on a couple of different podcasts and so she she sent me a link to listen to them. And one of them is a podcast that's on the iHeart network called you need therapy. Mm -hmm. And the girl that is the host of the podcast, her nickname is cat, which makes me a little bit crazy. Yeah. And her full name is Catherine DeFetta. And, mm. um, she spells Catherine like I do with a Y. And oh. so like, I kind of like love, hate her like on the same breath. Mm. And so anyway, she featured my friend, um, Tara on a series of podcasts recently that I thought you guys might find really fascinating. Um, they basically talk about what are the differences between like, um, like what's called abuse and what is violence? What's called abuse and what is just someone being a jerk? Like, or what is the difference between trauma, 
PTSD, panic attacks, like, you know, being in the flow and being in the river and mental health. And I'm going to take a a break for a mental health day or whatever it is like that's become more and more popular right now. Right. And so, um, they gave us some, um, some tips on proper language to use around, um, different things that have to do with mental health. And so I would like to offer a free plug to, um, um, Catherine DeFetta's um, You Need Therapy podcast on the iHeart Network, specifically her episodes featuring Tara Booker. Amazing. That's awesome. Where did you meet Tara? I met her in the fabulous country of Mexico. Oh, that was on your Mexico trip. That's yeah. amazing. Yeah. Um, so I would like to talk about synaptic pruning. Oh, that's my, I would thought, I never thought you would bring that up. That's amazing. I've got that in my notes too. What the yeah. hell is that? Are you serious? <laughs> no. no, but that would be amazing if she did. Oh, <laughs> okay. So this phrase came up on this, um, informational educational, uh, zoom that I was on mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and, And what they were talking about in this Zoom was um, how when we feel depressed, we go inward and we um, we make our world smaller and smaller and smaller. Um, But then she just randomly throws out synaptic pruning, which makes me go like, (laughs) I need to go look that up on Wikipedia. And um, and what she was talking about is how as we get older and older this thing happens called synaptic pruning, which refers to the process by which extra neurons and synaptic connections are eliminated in order to increase the efficiency of our neuronal transmissions. Let me break it down for you. (laughs) I'm like, what the hell is going on? Okay. So basically what it is, is it allows us to let go of things, including memories or trauma or whatever. I don't know if you ever really let go of trauma, but um, it allows you to let go of these things as you get older. So basically we're shedding stuff in order to allow more stuff to come into our lives. Hmm, kind of like a snake skin or something. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. And so what she specifically was referring to was during COVID, our, our lives went from out here to like everything is happening to like very small. Mm -hmm. And so now there's a ton of people who have what feels like social anxiety going out and going like, Oh my God, like I've been insular for two years and now I'm like going back out and, and there's all this weirdness going along with that. Anyway, this idea of synaptic pruning just blew my mind because I'm curious. I'm not saying this is true, But I have experienced in my own life with my mother specifically a ton of fear that happens as we get older. And I've experienced it with my friends, parents as well. And it's this idea of like, uh, and this is no disrespect to anyone getting older. And I'm not saying there aren't exceptions, but our world gets smaller and smaller, smaller as we retire, as you know. Even if we are still working, our pa- our kids have left the house, et cetera, et cetera. And it's interesting to me, and I'm not saying that there aren't things feeding into this fear. I think media has a huge uh, responsibility in that. But there's this idea where our world is smaller. And so we're paying more attention to like what's right here. Mm, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like really close to our face, really what is just right in front of us. And, I, and you see a lot of like in the world planning and like I need to have the you know in case something goes wrong Hmm. I need to be prepared kind of like doomsday prepper type stuff I'm not saying quite doomsday I mean legitimately like you know I'm I'm say I'm saving for a rainy day whether that means canned goods or that means you know I have to be very tight with my money or whatever it is and I'm fascinated by this because what I have noticed recently, especially talking to friends who have just had Thanksgiving encounters, people, there's so much fear happening in a generation and like our parents' generation that I'm noticing hmm. around like they're afraid for us. They're afraid. And look, there's plenty to be afraid of in this yeah. world. So I, I, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm not at all saying their fear is wrong, but 
I'm noticing for myself, and that's all I can control, that as I get older, I want to get more laid back and less constricted. Mm. Because, and I know that's going to be hard to do because like, you're not in your earning years anymore. And you do have to be a little bit more aware of all the different things. But I want to go into my later years just being like less like, don't go out and travel because there is a generation that I'm noticing has a ton and ton and ton and ton of fear they're dealing with. And so all I'm saying is I don't want to be that way. And I want to do whatever I need to do now to try and keep from growing old with lots of fear. Well, tell me, I'm very curious because I have a lot of people in my life who are of my parents' generation who I deeply care about and love. Like what kind of support, um, can we offer them that, that doesn't feel kind of like, well, you're getting older and shit's getting smaller. And like, it's cause like who wants to hear that? You know, like yeah. my mom and I often talk about how like some of the problems that she encounters in her work, she's the director of a senior center. Um, and she says, sometimes it's like being a kindergarten teacher, you know, it's like dealing with a bunch of five-year-olds because these adults have reverted back to really the tiniest, simplest things in life become like really big dramas. So like, there will be a huge fight in the kitchen over like how we're putting the lids on containers, you know? Right. And it's like, that's, that's like, about. Yeah. yeah, exactly. It's like, so, so how, how do we for ourselves as we are growing older and how do we also um, support ourselves, but how do we support people in that generation um, who might be experiencing that on a regular basis? Well, as we know, we are not an expert podcast, so I will put that out there first. These are my opinions. But I personally believe that in my parents' generation, and my parents were born in the early to mid-40s. So if my parents were alive, they would be in the... Uh, late Mm -hmm. seventies. So just to give you an idea, that's the generation that I'm referring to right now. I feel Mm -hmm. like in that generation, there was never any conversation around how are you feeling because that happened. It's a lot Mm -hmm. of, you just keep moving, you brush it under the rug there. And I'm not saying there weren't exceptions. I know there were, but at least how my mother grew up, it was a lot of, this is just life. It happens to you. You keep going, Mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. And so, and I'm not saying that fixes everything, but I do think giving anyone room and space to talk about what's really bothering them. Like, Mm -hmm. let's say that you're really pissed about the lids in the, in the kitchen. Mm -hmm. We all know that there's a bigger issue there. Mm -hmm. There's something triggering them that has nothing to do with the lids in the, in Mm -hmm. the kitchen. And so like, and I know there's not, you know, a lot of people aren't resourced and have the staffs to like be able to pull people aside and have those conversations. But it does make you wonder, like maybe there is something deeper you could actually tackle if there were the resources there, you Mm -hmm. know, Mm -hmm. to pull them aside and go, Hey, what's really going on? Is there, and you know, who knows what else is, potentially a part of the variable there. But I do think a lot of just asking people how they feel. I mean, that was very uncomfortable for my mom. If I'm being honest, Mm -hmm. when I would say like, yeah, how are you feeling about this? Like she, she ended up going to therapy for a while and she could get around language like that, but it made her very uncomfortable Mm -hmm to even be asked that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I, I, um, I think of, of course, like my immediate thing that I go to is my mom, you know, cause my mom is the person closest to me in that generation. And, um, something happened over Thanksgiving that I just, I made this little mental note of, and, and it's interesting that you're bringing this up and I'm curious to talk to her more about it. Um, but one of the things that, that we were talking about is, um, we had this mishap happen where we were all sitting in my mom's bedroom. Um, it was my mom, my sister, me and my youngest nephew. And I decided to sit at the foot of the bed on this plastic little set of stairs. That's for like a dog to get up on the bed. You know how like dogs that are too small to jump all the way up on the bed. Mm -hmm. Um, so I was sitting on this set of plastic steps and my nephew decided he wanted to play hide and seek. And so he crawled underneath the steps 
steps and he was moving around trying to get himself completely tucked under the steps. And in the process, the steps collapsed. And I, I fell on my nephew, my four year old nephew and like literally squashed him like a pancake because like Mm. I'm a big girl. And so the steps crumbled beneath me. The child was crushed by my unbearable weight. There was screaming and wailing and gnashing of teeth. I mean, it was just Mm. awful. It was awful. And so I I spilled my coffee. I threw my coffee cup across the room when I fell. And so there was coffee Mm. everywhere. And I was Mm. like, Oh my God, like this is so stressful. So like I cleaned up the coffee and my sister said, come back in here. And I said, I can't, I can't come back in here. And she said, why? I said, I am not comfortable. Like I have to go outside. I have to get away from this tragedy that I have just caused because I'm so <laughs> fat, you know, like this is just awful. And so I go outside and, um, I'm sitting there by myself and I'm kind of rocking back and forth, like just kind of going, it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. The child was okay. Like he has a little bruise on his foot and I did not like you know break his like cervical spine or anything like that thank (laughs) god and so um my mom came out a little while later and was sitting there with me and my sister and um my sister said to me something along the lines of she's like what like what is, what is wrong with you? Like, are you okay? And I said, I just sat on and crushed your child. Oh my God. And my mom started laughing like uncontrollably, (laughs) like just uncontrollably laughing. And so then it made us laugh. And so we're all sitting there together and we're like, mom, like, why are you laughing? And she just shook her head and she goes, because you either have to laugh or cry. (laughs) It's true, right? Because it was such an intense, like scary, awful situation. And it's like, my mom was like, I have two choices here. (laughs) Like I can, I can weep (laughs) or I can laugh, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Glennon Doyle, she calls her life brutal because it's like brutal and beautiful all at the same Uh time. And (laughs) same thing, like I'm with you. I have laughed in some of the most uncomfortable experiences of my life. Mm -hmm. I, first of all, I would like to point out that that thing was going to collapse if a 150 pound person was on it. <laughs> right. Right. I was so I stupid. See, I just need to say that for your benefit. <laughs> Thank that's you. That's okay with you. Of course. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. The thing should not have been sat upon to begin with. <laughs> upon. I love it. Uh, so I need to talk about vulnerability, sadly. Oh, okay. Because the next topic I have is liquid band aids. So what do you got? <laughs> Well, maybe that's like a, maybe that's a physical representation of what vulnerability is. Yeah. Okay. So look, here's the deal. I have been being coached by a good friend of mine. And one of the things that keeps coming up is, uh, speaking of fear, some fear that I have around the specific part of, um, of running a coaching practice. And so we've been going around and around and, and, I keep saying that I'm like, Oh, I know what it is. It's hard for me to be seen like that. That's what I think is happening. It's like just scratching the surface, you know? And I'm like, Oh, and what really was happening as I realized it is my coach said, you know, what is, what does Brene Brown say about vulnerability? And I was like, why you got to freaking throw Brene out there, man. I haven't (laughs) talked to her in like a year. And he said, um, she's become too mainstream for us. (laughs) <laughs> she's mm-hmm. too mainstream for us uh we love you dr queen b um but he said you know and i was like so embarrassed i didn't like know what about when people just ask you a question that is the most like what does Brene brown say about vulnerability well hell i got 23 books behind me i don't know <laughs> no, just kidding just kidding anyone listen. so anyway his thing his thing that he shared back with me is that you cannot have vulnerability without courage And I'm like, great. Well, I'm extremely courageous. So we're doing fine. And then I realized, oh, it's been a minute since I've been studying my Brene Bible. I probably should dive back in and see what's (laughs) going on there. And, you know, I do absolutely love Brene. I love that she brought vulnerability into the um, forefront. But as an Enneagram 8, that's like my nemesis. It's my kryptonite. Like I and the thing is, is like I could do it on the podcast 
because nobody's sitting there except y'all. It's it's just like, <laughs> oh, you know, and I don't re-listen like, oh, let me hear what I said. I, I don't do that. And so I just kind of throw it out there and be like, if it sticks, it sticks. Um, mm-hmm. But what I'm realizing is all of these walls I have that I think are about me not wanting to be seen in my coaching practice actually have to do with am I willing to put my own vulnerability on the line? Hmm. And so then what did I do when it came to that? I Googled what are examples of vulnerability? Cause Hmm. why ask your friends and create connection when you can just Google it? (laughs) Okay. So here, here are a few examples of vulnerability in case you need a refresher as well. And this one kind of blew my mind because Sarah does this really well. Kat, you do it too, but we both struggle with it. Dressing a certain way because it expresses who you are. That's vulnerability. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, I love that. Which I I just dress in all black so that I won't upset anyone. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. Okay. Okay. Um, if you're dressing a certain way because you want to impress others, that's actually manipulation. Hmm, I believe that. Oh, and vulnerability? No. Oh. If you're dressing to impress others, that's manipulation. Oh, okay. But dressing how you want to dress to express yourself is vulnerable. Yeah. And here's the last thing I want to say about that. Look, I try and be vulnerable. And when I don't get the reaction I want, then I'm like, fuck it. I'm never doing that again. Mm-hmm. And that in itself, I don't think is very vulnerable. <laughs> <laughs> You know what though, Moose, like you're, you're able to be vulnerable in these moments on the podcast. And I have listened back on several episodes where you have talked about something near and dear to you and your voice gets a little bit quivery and it's, Mm -hmm. it's so sweet and so vulnerable. And, and I've thought in those moments, like how honored I have felt to be one of the people actually talking to you about whatever it is that we're talking about, but then also like how honored I think our listeners feel as well to be able to be that uh, connected with you. And I would love to just celebrate that each time you do that, you are creating new neural pathways and you are getting more and more accustomed to, oh, what is it like for the sled to slide down this part of the hill instead of sliding down this part of the hill? And by the sled, mm. I mean the, the neuroplasticity in your, literally in your nervous system, like in your brain. And I would like to just celebrate mm-hmm. that you have been making tremendous efforts on rebuilding and, and recreating those pathways. And it's really inspirational. Well, thanks. Mm -hmm. I have a long way to go, but I am giving it my best and it's easy to do with you guys. But I I do think there is something there about like, what do you guys think vulnerability is? Um, I think vulnerability is being willing to trust when you aren't 100% sure you can. Oh, that's Hmm. good. That's really good. You know, it's kind of like, like when I got on a a good example for me, and this is very practical, but when I got on the gondola in Telluride a couple of weeks ago and the gondola pulled out of the station and then dipped straight down for like the next like quarter of a mile, I was like, I am completely trusting the people that I am with, like my best dude friend mark and his wife julie i'm completely trusting them that this is okay and this is safe and i'm also completely trusting this man-made machine to keep me safe and to me like that felt vulnerable because like that seems like a really dumb idea (laughs) to catapult oneself down a mountain (laughs) at like 60 feet above the ground (laughs) at a very extreme slope and so to me like that's a real practical um, example of vulnerability. Mm-hmm. It's like, I am going to completely trust something that I, that I, I can't 100% know for sure is trustworthy. Hmm. God, that just stressed me out. <laughs> <laughs> and when you're able to be vulnerable like that and trust something that you don't know is trustworthy and everything works out again, it yeah. recreates those, those neurological pathways of going like, Oh, I can trust this now. Like I can mm-hmm. get on the gondola next time with a little bit less fear. Yep. 
And what if the gondola is an example of life? Mm. It is like, mm. is like a metaphor of life of like, Hey, you're going to be scared shitless for a yeah. minute, you yeah. know, like at the beginning. And then you're going to start looking around and going, Oh my God, this is beautiful. As soon yeah. as I said that light just came through my window. Mm. It's That's like cool. Jesus. That's cool. Sarah, what is, what is vulnerability to you? Mm. For me, it's like that one the one like the soft underbelly or like that one uh really vulnerable or like um private spot that we keep covered with every ounce of us you know mm. wow um it, this is might be a silly analogy but i think of um i think it's in the the hobbit movie movie series where it's the the dragon um, Smaug, I think is his name. And like, basically the only way to get him, he has this one scale that's vulnerable and oh. you had to like, I don't know, they had to like shoot him in it or something. I don't know it enough. Sorry to the people that know it super well, but it, that's what it reminds me of. Like his whole exterior is so built up. And so we do that, like all of our, we've got all of that exterior so well built out. And there's that one little spot that we just it's not totally protected or, or oh, it becomes yeah. vulnerable. And that's the spot that, I don't know, you think of like a little puppy that's willing to like put their little belly up and, you know, yes. like, yes. and then you can see the really scared one that's like, mm -mm, I'm not, you know, or whatever. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know. I think that that to me is what vulnerability is. I am that scared puppy. Oh, I usually am too. I'm that matted down puppy that needs a bath, but I'm afraid Aww. for anyone to touch me. Moose, I'll give you a bath. Oh, that's really sweet. I just realized maybe the girl in the room that is crying her eyes out with blood coming out of her eyes. <laughs> uh, don't worry. It's just one of my internal family systems parts. Actually, she wasn't crying with blood until Kat gave me that. But then I thought <laughs> that kind of fits. But I think she's the vulnerable part. That's like, why did people leave me alone in here? Mm -hmm. God mm -hmm. bless. Yeah, I... I um. I love what you just said, Sarah. And it reminds me, you know, in, in, in the current place that I'm at in life right now, I have found that everything points back to Dallas theory. Like I'm just mm. convinced that it is mm. like all things point to the fricking yin yang symbol, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think of what you're talking about with the dragon, Sarah, and it reminds me of part of uh, my studies in um, local distal acupressure talks about armoring and um, mm. One of the things that local distal acupressure supports is basically allowing that armoring to either move or even like disappear so that you can get to yeah. the, the vulnerable places in an environment that is safe. Right. So exactly. it's not like, Hey, we want to get to your vulnerable place to shoot you. It's like, we want to get to your vulnerable place so that you yourself can see what it feels like in that moment for that place to be open and vulnerable, because then it allows the other surrounding armoring, um, to, to make adjustments or maybe even go away. And so it's like a lot of times the tension in the upper arms and shoulders and neck is all because of like, physical armoring because yep. we're like this in life. Yep. Totally. Yeah. Just bracing, bracing. Yeah. So I just think it's really cool that, um, like moose with your coaching and me with, uh, Jin Shindo and body work and stuff. It's like, it's like what we're trying to do is to try to, to create a supportive environment for people to be able to like go, Oh, I can let my shoulders rest a little. I can let my arms down a little. I can kind of explore like, well, what is it like for me to be my most precious, uh, unique and authentic self? Like yeah. that's really, really fun. Well, and training, you know, talking about the neuro, plasticity and like training these new pathways. It's like in doing so we're trusting ourselves. Like, you know, what I was sharing about my ketamine experience, I believe it was last week that I shared how I've never been more relaxed in my life. And that wasn't like, Oh, the drugs really relaxed me. It was no, like I can relax. Like mm -hmm. I didn't realize I can physically do that, mm -hmm. you know, and I have that ability and I know that I can go there, not with the drugs. Like my body knows how to yes. do it. Yep. And so that's in me. And so same with vulnerability when we know how to go, okay, if I can start trusting myself, mm -hmm. you know, 
then it's like, oh, I don't have to protect myself so much, like, or I don't have to protect myself from X, Y, or Z Mm -hmm. because I trust myself more, you know? Mm -hmm. And then maybe vulnerability grows. Like, I don't, you know what I'm saying? Like that part of you, that little kid in you or whatever, that thing you're protecting Mm -hmm. might get bigger. Mm -hmm. Well, it's, it's so cool. Like I just had this beautiful revelation, Sarah, because of what you just said. And it's like, um, like I, in, in, in my history, I have used, um, hypnosis. I have used body work. I have used alcohol. Um, Mm -hmm. I have used THC to basically Mm -hmm. find myself in an environment where I can be vulnerable and feel safe. Right. Yeah. And so it's Mm -hmm. like, okay, like I have done that. And what I noticed the other day driving home from my mom's after Thanksgiving is I was doing a practice in my head that I have learned from being in a body work session where I was able to work out some of my shit without the aid of any substance because my body knew how to do it. Yes. And so it's like, I think like, gosh, if we can find a way to maybe involve teachers, if you will, and maybe teachers or chemicals, maybe teachers or practitioners, maybe Mm -hmm. teachers or coaches or whatever it is in order to like say, hello, your body knows how to do this, Sarah, like your body knows how to do this. So then you don't need the ketamine Mm -hmm. every time that you want to go there. You know, it's like our, our therapist friend Tara on the podcast that I mentioned earlier earlier was talking about how, um, a lot of times we talk about addiction, um, and, and we attach shame to it. And that can be really dangerous because like one of her clients said to her one time that, um, my addiction saved my life. Hmm. Like if I was not caught in my addiction at that time, I would have committed suicide. And it's like, whoa, like what a, what a way to like kind of reframe things. Um, and so thank you, Sarah. Like, even if this is not meant for the podcast and it's meant for my own internal personal revelation, like, thank you for sharing that. That's really meaningful to me. Yeah. Thank you. (laughs) <laughs> I agree. Like I'm, I'm sitting here thinking about how hard I try to keep people out. Hmm. Like it's an active thing hmm. to the point that like, I'm thinking, okay, vulnerability, vulnerability, vulnerability as we're talking. And I'm sitting here going for me, what, what is really difficult is letting people in even to the tiniest level. And so I'm constantly planning my day uh, by measuring how much energy I give. Hmm. And so I'm wondering if for me stepping out and, and being vulnerable is letting people have some of my energy. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. And I would imagine, and tell me if this, if this resonates at all, I would imagine that you have had experiences where, offering your energy has depleted you. Yeah. For 44 years. Right. And so (laughs) what, what incentive does, do you have to offer that up when each time it's been offered up for 40 some odd years, it's been depleted and you've, you've been unable to survive, which is trauma, (laughs) you know, it's like, it's, it's really understandable. And thank you for the moments where you let us in moose. Oh man, bring it on. I picture my neuro pathways as like these dusty roads on a country <laughs> road that I'm just like, well, why take the highway when you could take this way again? <laughs> you know what I mean? And it's I like, do. I'm, I'm looking for a damn Starbucks on a dusty road and those are <laughs> off the highway. It's like, come on shit, man. Get on the highway. But then you can find some of the most beautiful coffee shops in the world that are like a one of a kind on those back roads. And it's like you've never had that good of a cup of coffee. That's Mm. right, y'all. Look at our metaphors. We are incredible. I mean, we are a metaphor podcast. It makes me think of like uh, doing local distal acupressure. A lot of times we talk about working the extraordinary flows, energy flows of the body. And one of the things we talk about is it's kind of like dredging the channels. So talking about like neuro pathways and stuff like that, I'm like the metaphors just keep on coming. It's amazing. (laughs) Mm -hmm. (laughs) What is dredging? What do you mean? 
kind of like uh like when you think of like like for example they dredge percy priest lake oh. you know like they basically they go and they get all the all the shit that's like causing things to be clogged up and they gotcha. kind of free up the flow of the different channels in the lake so it, it's like look that. that's how you need to market yourself cat is i will <laughs> unclog your system <laughs> If you say, if you say, let me unclog, I've got it. It is Cat Davis, Jin Shindo. Let me unclog your chakras. <laughs> I would totally pay for that. That's amazing. I'll get you to pay for it. I need some paid clients, so bring it on. <laughs> me and- too. <laughs> We'll just send the same $150 back and forth. Yeah, but just back and forth and back and forth. Oh my gosh, you guys are going to a live, real live, in person, in November with 60 degree weather football game today. Woo-hoo! What is up? The Bengals, the Cincinnati Bengals. Who day? Who day? Who day think gonna beat those Bengals? Nobody. They're playing the Titans, which I also love. Uh huh. So it's going to be a tough game to decide who to root for. But I'm sorry, I have to go with my roots. With roots. your roots, and and so Sarah, I noticed that today um, on our uh, Zoom, you were wearing a Bengals T-shirt. So mm-hmm. are are you like fully rooting for the Bengals, or are you no. going to kind of split your loyalties? What's that going to look like? Always, <laughs> I have to root for everyone. Oh yeah, and so. <laughs> I even when I watch football, I'm like, yeah, whoever's got the ball, like, go, go, go. And then people are like, don't, why are you doing it? It's it's really a hard thing to sit next to. Yeah. (laughs) But I mean, they're doing a good job. They're playing (laughs) the game. Okay. So I've got my Bengals t shirt on, but I also have permission to buy one of those. Those finger thing, the giant fingers that you put the foam thing. Yeah, hopefully there's, they exist still, yeah. but a Titans one. So I'm going to have nice. a Titans foam finger with the Bengals shirt and I may get booed out of the stadium for, for repping both, but I'm here to rep both teams because on the fantasy football league team, whatever we've got, we've got players from both teams. Oh, nice. That is true. Mm hmm. Nice. Well, I think it's totally reasonable that you root for both just because you can, but then you've got another incentive. Yeah. The hard thing is going to be sitting around other Titans fans yeah. and not me yelling for the Bengals, but also Sarah yelling for both teams. I think people are going to get very confused, but we'll get through it. I don't think they're going to be paying attention to us. Oh, well, and if they are, they're probably going to be drunk. So, you know, each of them are exploring their own abilities Mm -hmm. to be vulnerable. So just be an example of being able to live in the duality, you know, Mm -hmm. like just just be a light in the darkness, guys. Light in the darkness. Keep the candle burning. Um, One thing that I think is really special is these tickets are from um, our friends, Steve and AJ, who have season tickets at the Titans. And. I had the thought last night as I was getting excited about going to the game. I've actually never been in the Titan stadium for a football game. So that's going to be fun, Mm. even though I've lived here for 20 years, but I was like, I'm going to sit in the same seat that my friend Steve sat in Mm -hmm. and is no longer here. And I just thought like, what an honor to be like, Mm. this is where he watched Titans football games from, you know? Yeah. So yes. I'm excited about that's, that. That's that's really cool, Moose. And if a frog shows up, I'm gonna oh, man. shit my pants. Oh, man. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I want to share. I'm really excited about sharing this soon. And um, I had the chance. Speaking of Dallas Theory, cat. Um, I had the chance to interview a friend of mine who is a fellow coach, and she's trained in focusing. Her name is Birgit. She lives in Germany. And uh, she is teaching a workshop in January on the I Ching, otherwise known as the Cosmic Way. Um, If you don't know what that is, you need to tune in. We're probably going to edit it into next week's podcast, or we may just drop it as a separate thing. But super excited to share Mm -hmm. with you guys and our listeners about the I Ching um, and uh, what that can possibly mean in your life. Yep. That is so exciting, Moose. I can't wait to hear about your and Birgit's discussions. That's amazing. Yes. I love Birgit. Should we sing a song at the end? What's coming to your heart, Kat? Are we out of the woods? Are we out of the woods? Are we out of the woods? 
Yet are we in the clear? 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 Yet are